Hi there, and thank you for taking the time to come and watch this talk on Lyme disease. My name is Rosie Milsom. I'm Charity Manager at Cordwell Lyme Co. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about um, Lyme disease, uh, what it is, um, how to prevent getting it, how to spot the symptoms and what to do if you think that you might have Lyme disease. So let's get started. So firstly, just a little bit about Cordwell Lyme Co and what we do to try and set the scene. Um, so we're quite a, a new and small charity. We're based in Staffordshire. Um, our core mission is to fund research um, that will improve the uh, current uh, tests and treatments that are available for Lyme disease on the NHS. Um, but alongside that, we also campaign to raise awareness of Lyme disease and educate the public um, about tick bite prevention. Um, and we do that through uh, things such as free awareness talks, like um, the one that I'm delivering today for this recording, um, attending events, um, uh, conferences, when such things are taking place. And we also provide a patient information and advice service for um, those who might be suffering from Lyme um, and perhaps want some support to make sure that they, they're receiving the correct um, diagnosis and, and treatment from the NHS. Um, the information we give is based on the NICE guideline, which we helped to form uh, back in 2018. So that's us now to Lyme disease. Uh, some of you might uh, be familiar with Lyme disease, some of you perhaps not. So we'll just go through some general information about Lyme. So it's, it's a disease that's caused through the bite of an infected tick and it can attack the nerves, joints, brain, heart, eyes, and can cause a characteristic skin rash. Now the symptoms of Lyme disease are similar to quite a lot of other illnesses. We'll talk about the symptoms in more depth later on, but the initial symptoms can be a lot like the flu um, or even coronavirus. Um, and as the disease progresses, um, it can manifest itself um, in uh, conditions such as like MS, uh, Parkinson's, a lot of people with chronic Lyme disease or late stage Lyme often get uh, diagnosed with things like chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. Um, so yeah, it, it's called the great imitator because its symptoms mimic so many other illnesses. Um, if it's treated and um, well, spotted and treated quickly, um, most people make a, a full recovery. Um, but if it isn't, then the infection can uh, spread within the body and leave patients with chronic illnesses or permanent nerve or tissue damage, along with other life limiting symptoms. So that's why we're really keen to kind of raise awareness about it and make sure people know what to look out for. So talking about ticks, so ticks are from the spider family, from the arachnid family. Uh, they've got eight legs like a spider and they tend to live mostly in long grass. Um, in bushes or foliage, uh, in woods or forests, um, but they can also be found in urban parks and gardens. And they wait on the tip of plants, a bit like the chap in the photo here, uh, with their front legs out, it's called questing. And when um, you or an animal or something brushes past, sometimes they climb on. Now, some of these ticks, a, small, a relatively small percentage, um, I think the average is about 15%, carry bacteria which can be transferred when they feed on the blood of their hosts and cause a Lyme disease infection. So um, this image here from uh, Lyme Disease Action, I think is always really good for demonstrating just how small ticks are um, and therefore why it's so important to look for them. Um, you know, you won't necessarily feel them crawl on you or bite you and they're so tiny, they're really easy to miss. They can be as tiny as a poppy seed. Um, but if you take that, um, that image there as a thumbnail, uh, you know, and, and look down, then as I say, you really can see the kind of scale of what you're dealing with there. So you've got your adult female there and adult male, and then your nymph tick and your larva tick. And it's thought that the nymph tick is the one responsible for the majority of cases of Lyme disease, possibly because of the life stage they're at and um, how often they might feed. So I'm going to take you through a couple of case studies now um, just to kind of set the scene. So um, some of you may or may not know that Matt Dawson, the former England rugby player, um, ended up needing heart surgery after he uh, got bitten by a tick whilst exercising in uh, Richmond Park in London. 
um, the infection um, spread to his heart and caused uh, potentially deadly irregular heartbeats. Um, so he had surgery. I believe he's still on medication and today, although they're much, much better. So he's often a, a really great advocate for raising awareness about um, ticks and Lyme disease. And a case study of someone who came to the charity for advice. Um, so Liz's uh, four-year-old son developed symptoms of Lyme disease and as they were quite an outdoorsy family, um, they were aware of ticks and the risks. They normally keep uh, um, a tick removal tool out on them when they head out and about, but she hadn't spotted a tick this time. Uh, he didn't show any major symptoms apart from sniffles, but he did have the characteristic rash, which again we'll speak about later. Um, but she did struggle to get the correct um, treatment from her doctors so we helped her to support her in that and he took three weeks of antibiotics and, and fully recovered I'm happy to say. Uh, but just goes to show it doesn't really discriminate in terms of um, age or health you know it really can affect anybody. So there are some key, the key, kind of key issues when we're looking at, at Lyme disease and the reasons why we need to be kind of aware um and help to spread that awareness um is that cases are growing rapidly um in in across the uk and europe across the world really um i mean cases have you know world health organization has put out uh, warnings about the rising cases of lyme disease um up to the uh, 2010 which is when they last released figures it was spreading across europe faster than hiv and measles and it's the fastest growing uh, vector-borne disease in europe absolutely full stop um current estimates from public health england put it around two to three thousand a year but there was research um published in 2019 which found that the actual cases diagnosed at gp levels suggest it's more like nine thousand cases a year which is around 24 people a day uh, but it's likely that there are more cases that just haven't been diagnosed yet uh, partly because of point two there because symptoms are similar to a lot of other illnesses so that's a key issue because it makes it difficult to spot um, one of the third key issues is that unfortunately the current tests on the NHS aren't 100% accurate so they do sometimes turn um, false uh, negative results. They're what's called an antibody test um, which means um, it can only tell you if you've ever had Lyme disease. There isn't a current test for cure um, but there are circumstances that mean sometimes the test might miss that antibody response. And also experience and knowledge among medical professionals is still relatively low. Um, because in the past it's been quite a rare disease, becoming less so now. Um, I think doctors just aren't as familiar with it um, and the, the issues it can cause. And also at the moment, you know, people are spending more time outside due to the pandemic. Um, you know, we're heading out into more green spaces or where that is where we can socialise at the moment. And I've no doubt a lot of those habits will continue. So uh, we're potentially being exposed um, to ticks more. So that's why we want to help spread awareness and keep people safe and to try and mitigate these uh, key issues. So we're talking about risk factors for Lyme disease. So ticks spread Lyme disease when they bite and feed on the blood of their hosts. And ticks um, live in all parts of Britain. Um, so we do sometimes hear from uh, patients um, whose doctors or pharmacists say, you know, it can't be Lyme disease, we don't get Lyme disease in in this county or in this country or this area of the UK. But the, the previous study that I mentioned that was published in 2019 found that um, cases of Lyme disease were diagnosed in every county of the UK. So that is categorically not true. It is possible um, to catch Lyme um, anywhere. And we say they're potentially where there are animals because generally where there are animals, um, whether that's deer, hedgehogs, um, squirrels, uh, mice, um, then there's likely to be ticks and some of those ticks may be infested with Lyme disease. Now you can be bitten at any time of the year. May to October carries the highest risk because um, ticks like warm, humid weather. So when it's warmer and humid or wetter, they're going to be out and more active, but they are active um, and out during the winter as well. So something to be aware of all year round. And one of the other risk factors is the fact that you won't um, feel ticks crawl on you or bite you, um, partly because they're so tiny, but also I believe they have some kind of antiseptic um, in their bite. So you won't you won't feel them. There won't be any kind of warning. You really will need to look for them and remove them um, in order to reduce the risk um, of the tick passing on uh, Lyme disease. 
So, and we're talking about where you're most at risk. Um, so if you're spending time in forests or woods, um, out as we discussed earlier, in any kind of urban park, um, if you're a keen gardener um, and spend a lot of time in the garden, you might also be at risk. Um, in fields, particularly those with long grass, um, but really any kind of field. Um, and so uh, as per the image there, camping might be classed as like a slightly high risk activity. And if you spend time or um, work alongside animals, you may also be at further risk. So if you spend a lot of time outdoors and um, for your job um, or your leisure activities, then um, it's definitely something to think about. So prevention is always better than the cure, um, as, as the old saying goes. So the best way to avoid getting Lyme disease is, is to avoid being bitten by a tick in the first place. And there are some uh, quick and easy ways to do this. Um, so our first tip is usually to tuck um, your clothes in. So that's, um, you know, tuck your t-shirt into your trousers, tuck your trousers into your socks, um, especially if you're going uh, walking in long grass. Um, we do say try and stick to well maintained pathways if you can, but appreciate if you out in the fields or what have you as part of your job, that might not always be um, easily done. And I know tucking your trousers into your socks doesn't sound like the sexiest of looks, um, but essentially what you're trying to do is block any route of entry because uh, ticks might um, kind of brush on to you. As you brush past, they may climb on. Uh, but they will then climb down perhaps to the um, edge of your uh, hem and under they like to head anywhere that it's warm so they will try and uh, head off to attach to your skin so if you're tucking your trousers into your socks or just you know into your boots then you're just blocking that route of entry and just keeping yourself safe and we say there to cover your skin especially your legs purely for the reason that if you are walking through long grass or fields then you know your your legs are going to be most exposed at that level um, I appreciate during the kind of hot summers that we do get for a week or so in the UK, um, you won't want to wear trousers. And so for that reason, moving on to tip two, we would say spray insect repellent spray on any exposed skin. Um, so whether that's just your wrists and ankles or whether it's your um, arms or legs. We say they're uh, one containing DEET, um, but there are a couple of, if you're trying to live a non-toxic lifestyle or you're not great with chemicals, there are a couple of uh, natural um, insect repellents. One is called Incognito and one is called uh, Mozigard, um, and they have both been shown to be effective against repelling ticks. Um, if you do spend a lot of time outside or you spend a lot of time camping, um, then you can spray permethrin on your clothes, which is not only an insect repellent, but I believe it kills um, insects on impact. Um, and you can also spray your tent or sleeping bag. Um, you can also buy pre-treated clothes with permethrin, which lasts a certain amount of washes. So that's always a good option. Our third tip, so we say, say they to sit on a picnic cloth, picnic blanket. Um, basically we're saying don't sit directly on the grass. If you are going out for a picnic with family and friends, um, if you work outside and you're taking a break, um, if you're out camping, try and put something between you and the grass. Again, so there's that barrier um, between you so ticks can't climb on. Our fourth tip would be if you do work outside, you're out for a long walk or you um, have gone camping, Try and tumble, uh, tumble dry your clothes for 30 minutes when you get in because the heat from the tumble dryer will kill off any ticks that you might have brought into the house on your clothing, um, which is possible to do. Um, and ticks can live inside your home for up to three weeks without a feed. So you definitely don't want to be bringing in any nasties if you can help it. Um, if you don't have a tumble dryer, I don't, um, then uh, if you put them on for a hot wash as hot as the clothes that you've got can stand, that should also do the job. And then the fifth one we would say is check each other and yourselves and your pets for ticks. Um, if you're out all day, we normally suggest rec uh, rec suggest checking yourself. So every four hours at least, uh, but certainly when you get home. So we've got Bart and Lisa Simpson here to demonstrate for us where you should be looking for ticks. So um, there's no kind of gentle way to say it other than ticks like warm, soft crevices. Um, they are like little spider men. They um, they will you know crawl and climb uh, where you wouldn't expect them to. 
Um, so key places that we suggest people look when they come in from outside um, is in your armpit, um, inside your waistband, um, or uh, for ladies, um, inside your bra strap. Again, they like going somewhere that's kind of warm, snug against the skin, slightly hidden. Um, inside your belly button, um, in your groin area, especially for men, I'm afraid, uh, between your toes and also in the hairline um, or on the neck or behind the ears. The hairline tends to be one, uh, quite a popular one for children. I'm not sure if it's because of the, the height they're at as they, um, you know, walk past in long fields. Um, but your hairline often seems to be a popular one. And as Lisa says there, you might need a tick body to check the parts of you that you can't see yourself, such as, you know, behind your ears, um, on your neck, that kind of thing. So this is um, an image that I, I thought might be useful to share. So on the left, we've got a tick, uh, what it looks like, very zoomed in, of course, um, before a feed. And then the one on the right is what a, a tick looks like after it's had its feed. So as I mentioned earlier, they can be as tiny as a poppy seed, but they can grow as big as a baked bean. Those of you with um, uh, cats or dogs might recognize the image a little bit more on the right, but I think it's always useful um, to, to know what they look like in case you do see one, in case one does feed off you or your um, pet and drops off in the home and this is what you see, you know, it could easily be mistaken for something like a wood louse. Uh, you might want to put it outside, but at least with this you know what it is and so you can get rid of it. So, steps on how to remove a tick um, safely and correctly. So the first thing, if you do find a tick attached to you anywhere on your body, the first thing we would say is to never delay removing a tick. Um, there is an old school of thought that ticks need to be attached for kind of 24 to 48 hours in order to have a chance to transfer the Lyme disease bacteria. But the truth is there hasn't been enough research done on this area. Um, there was a study published a few years ago that found uh, Lyme disease bacteria was transmitted in as little as six hours. Um, but, the, you know, the longer the tick is attached, the more chance it has to transfer. You won't, you don't need to go to your GP or a walk-in centre or even A&E. It's something that you could and should do yourself as soon as you spot a tick. Um, so uh, to, to remove it, you want to be using um, a tick remover tool or pointed tweezers. Definitely, and that is important that they're pointed and not the flat edged ones because the flat edged ones are more likely to uh, squeeze the tick's body and that's something that you want to avoid. Um, you can buy a tick removal tool for a few pounds from, um, you know, camping shops, online stores, um, and then just keep it in your pocket if you're heading out camping or for work or for a long walk and then you've got it to hand. Um, we do say there, if you're desperate, scrape off the, um, the tick off with a fingernail or credit card. It isn't the, the, the recommended one, um, recommended method, but if you're going to be out for quite some time, say more than four hours before you can get to using a, a tool um, to get it off, then that's kind of a last resort thing that you can do. It may leave the head embedded, um, but as long as the body is removed, that's where the um, Lyme disease bacteria is, then it may, go, it may be that the head, um, it, you know, goes slightly septic, but that's still preferable to... Uh, the Lyme disease bacteria being transferred and the body will eject the head um, eventually on its own even if you can't get it out. Um, the third tip there is to lift straight up so whether you're using a tick twister tool um, which is you know also twists and lift straight up but um, you know if you're using any other tool you want to be lifting straight up rather than to the side in order to have the best chance of pulling it out in one piece and again there don't don't squeeze the tick's body. And then once you've um, pulled the tick out, if you disinfect the bite and wash your hands with soap. And uh, fifth tip and very important is that we do not recommend you put any substance on the tick. There is a bit of an old wives tale where, um, you know, people are told to put on Vaseline or oil or um, even alcohol. Sometimes I think the thought is that the tick will um, either become Kind of disorientated or suffocated and uh, and therefore drop off but what's more likely to happen is that you'll aggravate the tick and cause it to uh, regurgitate the contents of its stomach into you and then therefore increase the risk of Lyme disease so we say definitely don't put any substance on the tick just remove it um, quickly and safely. So there's a few examples here of um, some tick remover tools um, 
you know, all of them uh, can, have been shown to be effective. You've got your tick key there. You can get um, flat uh, ones that are kind of credit card size so shape that you can pop in your wallet and you can see there um, on the top right, uh, uh, the eagle eye of you can see there's a small tick there between the duck lips. You just slide it on and, and pull it up. Uh, there's the tick twister there on the bottom left, as we discussed, and some pointed tweezers as well. So again, just a few pounds um, and then you've got them then for life. So have I got Lyme disease? So I'm going to take you through some of the key symptoms for Lyme disease now. So the initial symptoms, you might feel a bit like flu. Um, so you'll have a bit of a fever, um, perhaps a headache, um, you know, stiff neck or neck pain. And for some people, as a disease progresses, um, it can travel into the joints and cause joint pain, kind of real you know, arthritic, inflammatory arthritis um, that may move from one joint to another. Um, a lot of Lyme sufferers experience fatigue, um, you know, kind of a real bone aching fatigue. For some people like uh, Matt Dawson, it can travel into the heart and cause an irregular heartbeat. Uh, some patients, um, it may travel to the brain and cause um, some kind of paralysis or nerve damage. Uh, for some people that might mean a paralysed face or what we call Bell's palsy, that can be um, a sign of Lyme disease. Uh, lots of um, Lyme sufferers uh, suffer uh, from cognitive issues. Um, so like uh, they often describe it as like brain fog, so kind of confusion, memory loss, that kind of thing. Now the only symptom that is individual to Lyme disease is um, the bullseye rash or um, its official name is the erythema migraines rash. Now the um, example here from the CDC website um, is a very clear distinct um, bullseye rash. Not all rashes um, do appear this perfect uh, in terms of bullseye rash um, but what's important about the rash that comes with Lyme disease is that um, it's red, uh, it spreads out over a number of days. It's generally flat and not itchy and because it's the, it's the bacteria spreading underneath the skin rather than a, rea you know, a, a reaction to the bite, although that is possible as well. Um, it usually will develop some kind of central clearing, but as I say, it doesn't have to be as clear as that. It's, it's more about the, the progression outwards that it's usually flat maybe slightly raised at the edges um, it will normally appear within a few days of being bitten but it can appear up to a month afterwards um, and unfortunately it doesn't appear for every patient um, it's thought about two out of three people might develop the rash possibly less it may not develop in the area that you were bitten so um, if you do find a tick attached in you know the crook of your elbow for example it is possible for the rash to appear elsewhere on the body um, but yes if you do get the rash um, the rash is diagnostic for Lyme disease which means that you should be diagnosed and treated on that basis alone without blood testing that is as per the NICE guideline, and that's because the rash is a more reliable indicator of the disease than the blood test. So in some ways, it's kind of lucky if you do get the, um, if you do get the rash. Um, but as I say, unfortunately, not everybody gets it. So just a, a, a kind of further overview there of the, of the symptoms and, and some of the things that you might experience. Um, so talking about the brain, you know, we had memory loss, inability to concentrate, headache or neck pain um, and stiffness. For some people, it might affect the eyes as well. So you might get blurred vision or floaters or irregular pupils. As I say, some people might experience nerve pain. Um, so whether that's pins and needles, electric shock, um, numbness, um, paralysis for some people or twitching. Uh, for some people, it might, uh, as we spoke about, cause joint pain. For some people, it's muscle pain and weakness, um, a real kind of real, real bone aching fatigue and um, heart issues or general immune system problems like swollen, you know, any usual symptoms of an infection like swollen glands, uh, fevers, chills, that kind of thing. Um, now, symptoms with Lyme disease can take up to three months to appear. Um, I think because the, the bacteria with Lyme disease um, is very... It moves quite slowly within the body, but it also um, is very clever at evading the immune system. So it takes a while for the immune response to develop. 
Um, so that is something, um, just something there to be aware of. Now you're not, if you do get Lyme disease, you won't get necessarily symptoms from every single um, group of symptoms here, but it is what they call a multi-systemic disease, which means it, it affects multiple areas of the, of the, um, of the body. So you would expect um, to experience, you know, at least two, three, possibly more from this area. So I just touched um, briefly on Lyme disease and coronavirus because there is a bit of a crossover in symptoms and there were um, a few examples, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, where people were diagnosed with coronavirus and when they actually had Lyme disease. So the crossover symptoms are the flu-like ones, so like fever, chills, um, fatigue, um, sweats, that kind of thing. Um, what you get in Lyme disease that you don't get in COVID is the rash that we mentioned previously um, and also, uh, you know, the neck and, and joint pain, you know, the arthritic joint pain. And then, um, in, you know, if you, if it's, you know, it's COVID because of any respiratory uh, symptoms, generally there aren't any respiratory symptoms with Lyme disease. Um, and also those classic symptoms like loss of taste or smell, digestive issues, the, um, you know, COVID taste rash, that kind of thing, then you know it's COVID and not Lyme. So if you've got Lyme disease, what do you do? Um, so you should see your doctor if you know that you've been bitten by a tick or either been bitten by a tick, either you saw it and had to remove it, or if you know that you are somewhere um, you know, somewhere where you could have been exposed to ticks and you later develop symptoms like the flu, bearing in mind that it can take up to three months to develop, then you should go see your doctor. Um, you should go see them if you develop the rash, like we spoke about on the previous slides. Um, if you uh, experience strange symptoms in your nerves, like tingling or paralysis. And we always say never delay seeing your doctor if you suspect Lyme disease. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the sooner that Lyme disease is diagnosed and treated, the, the more chance of a, a full and quick recovery. So um, it's really important that if you do, um, you know, do have any suspicions that you go and speak to your doctor. Um, if you do have Lyme disease, you, as with anything, you should take all the medicine prescribed, even if you start to feel well. Uh, the standard treatment is three to six weeks of antibiotics, depending on your symptoms. Um, currently, there's no test for cure. Um, the, I think we might have mentioned earlier, the test is antibody based. Um, so unfortunately, it isn't possible currently to test after treatment to see if you've been cured. So it has to be done uh, based on your symptoms. Um, so if you're still uh, feeling ill after the three week course, then your doctor should prescribe you a further um, three weeks of a, of a different antibiotic. Um, and then see um, how you feel after that. So we just want to kind of end the presentation by saying that um, we want people to enjoy the outdoors. Um, you know, we don't want to kind of scaremonger or, or have people concerned. Um, we absolutely know the physical, emotional, mental benefits of the outdoors. Um, and we really encourage people to head out and enjoy that. We just want um, them to do so safely and, and just be aware of a, a few things that can hopefully stop them from getting ill. So if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to drop us a line. Um, the email address is there, whether that's an, a general question or, or something about your personal situation. As I say, we do run that patient information and advice service. So we'll do our very best to help. But yeah, if you have any questions about the presentation, if you'd like us to deliver one directly to um, a community group um, or organization that you think would benefit from a, a tailored um, free talk where they'll be able to ask uh, any questions live then do feel free to get in touch we we deliver these free um, as part of our awareness program um, but yes we love hearing from people and um, you know if you do have any feedback about the presentation as well we're more than happy to receive it um, also if you do want any more information on um, Lyme disease symptoms treatment uh, the NICE guideline um, keeping yourself um, and your family and your pets safe um, but also you know if you're interested in our work as a charity and you want to find out how how we can help uh, you can head to our website there cordwelllime.com and we're also on uh, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter um, if you want to follow us there uh, for news on uh, Lyme disease awareness 
um, facts, tips and work as a charity. Um, but that's it. So thank you very much for um, listening. Um, you know, stay safe um, say enjoy, enjoy the outside and and take care. Thanks then.